Yeah, thank you, Lawrence. So as you're walking out, I would like to thank Lawrence um, uh, and McGill for organizing this, and also just for, as Lawrence mentioned, I've, I've definitely benefited um, from participating in, in this workshop from all of you as well, but also for, in these McGill events over the last five or six years. Um, kind of critically, you know, shaped the way I think about some of these issues. Uh, I'd also like to thank Connie. Uh, and the FPR for organizing this event. I think it's been a, a great event. It's been nice to get to know everyone uh, a little bit. Okay, so um, so what I want to I'm going to talk about the broad <laughs> topic of uh, field methods, but it's not going to be that as as that broadly defined. Um, I am going to focus uh, most particularly on culturally sensitive assessments of what I would call, rather than mental health, I would call uh, subjective well-being. Um, and I'm going to focus on some examples from two studies. Uh, one is a study um, among the Sahara, an indigenous group in central India referred to as the Saharia, uh, who are sometimes referred to as conservation refugees. I'll, refer to, I'll explain that a little bit in a moment. Uh, and then also on some of my work uh, in virtual worlds. Um, which I also understand, and in, in particular online games of various kinds, which I understand as kind of communities and social places and communities uh, uh, and worlds uh, of a kind. Um, and in particular, I'll focus on, um, in those two contexts, how I develop these kind of culturally sensitive, uh, subjective well-being, kind of positive and negative uh, experience scales that actually became quite important to answering some of the questions uh, that I had in, in some of the, in these, in these two studies. Um, and, you know, trying to, you know, through talking about those examples, uh, my main goal is to help you see how uh, you might even integrate some of these same techniques uh, into your own uh, projects. Uh, a key takeaway message, if you, you know, you don't, you don't remember anything else, um, you know, like Ian Gold's talk, is the context matters. Um, uh, and so I'm going to talk about both some ethnographic and then what I would call these kind of cognitive anthropological uh, cultural domain analysis techniques that can help you establish uh, meaningful context. So ethnography for kind of general social and ecological context. Uh, and then these, this kind of these cultural, this cultural domain analysis, things you've heard us talk about, like free listing and pile sorting, uh, and then these analytical techniques like cultural consensus analysis and cultural constants analysis uh, to elicit what I would call meaningful, or I would call frames of meaning or frames of reference, uh, sometimes referred to as cultural models. Um, I take a very so, I take a, I take a very cognitive anthropological. Uh, cultural knowledge approach to these uh, kinds of uh, issues. You know, what are the kinds of things that people know that shape the way, not only their subjective well-being, but in general the way they think uh, and behave. And people have kind of personal kinds of understandings of various kinds, but they also have what I, what I call uh, cultural understandings, which in this framework is understood to be socially learned and transmitted kinds of uh, understandings. Um, you know, you've heard a little bit of discussion between myself and Lawrence and others. Um, this is a kind of, rep uh, this schema or cultural models or cultural frames of reference approach. Uh, it is what I would call um, a, a kind of uh, representational approach to, to knowledge, like the kinds of things that people know and even that people have these kind of inner uh, representations of, uh, of knowledge in their, in their heads in some sense. Um, but the big takeaway, it's this kind of inside what's in you and what you know, the kind of interaction between that and your environment uh, and your society uh, that, is, that is real uh, key here. Uh, there are readings, and I have the recommended readings. I think only the required readings, which really focus on these two scales. There's only two required. Uh, required. I mean, required is a loose word. I don't know who actually read them. You can, if you're interested, you can read them. A lot of things I'm going to go over quite quickly uh, are there, obviously, in much more detail. Uh, but there's also some other recommended readings, mainly by myself and my collaborators, which if you're interested in these topics, uh, you, know, you can look at those uh, as well. Um, I have more caveats, but I think I'm just going to, uh, well, maybe just a couple more things. Uh, one thing, so this, this cultural models approach, I think it's very useful. 
And I hope you'll see some of the ways it's useful. And I think it's actually relatively easy to do. <laughs> through these you know, interviews, free listing, pile sorts, kind, kinds of things that you can understand kind of cultural domains of understanding. That's why I'm talking about it and that's why I do it. It's definitely not everything. So don't be confused. So I don't want to be doctrinaire here. It's more that there's, a, there's going to be some techniques that I think are pretty easy to integrate into some of your projects as one kind of proxy of culture. A lot of my colleagues in the natural sciences and ecology, et cetera, they say, hey, I want, to, you know, I want to understand culture and I want to get into my project. How do I do that? This kind of schema, cultural frames, consensus, consonants, et cetera, approach is a way to do that. It's not the only way. Ethnography is important, you know, interpretive, qualitative methods are very important, but they're harder to integrate into a kind of maybe a more quantifiable, uh, you know, scientific kind of study coming from another discipline. And this is another, this is a way you can actually measure culture, a proxy for certain dimensions of culture uh, that can be readily, very readily uh, integrated uh, into your projects. Um, okay. Last thing is, if you have questions, just ask. Uh, I, was, I was thinking again of Ian Gold. I think I am invested in getting through all these slides, <laughs> but I'm more invested in you understanding and you know finding things that are useful uh, and interesting to you. Okay, so first, so I'm going to I'm going to go through a couple studies and kind of give you a behind the scenes uh, view of some of the things that I was doing. So I'm going to start with the Sahara, these conservation refugees, and then I'm going to talk about the virtual worlds. And in the middle, I have a little little fun thing that we're going to do. Okay, so I want to start with um, this discussion of these Saharia uh, indigenous groups. Um, uh, it's a human displacement study. So these, the, the, the Saharia uh, are a community of, they're referred to as Adivasis, or first inhabitants. Uh, so like India's indigenous groups or India's, if you're an American or United States, in India's Indians, right? So there are actually hundreds of these groups uh, that are less fully integrated into a, a caste uh, society, uh, for example. So the first study I want to talk about is assessing in the con a, a displacement study. So what some people would call internally displaced peoples rather than refugees. So there was a community that was moved outside of a uh, a wildlife sanctuary uh, for various conservation ends, and then a community, and then others that were left, you know, in the buffer zone of this uh, conservation um, area. And I was comparing kind of subjective and other forms of well-being uh, in this context. Okay, so context matters. So let, let's get at least a few <laughs> photographs. So this is one of the main um, um, villages I worked in. Uh, pseudonymously, I call it um, Bakcha. Uh, um, and this is actually, so you can see, um, um, uh, you can see the, um, uh, the, the village here in the front with these kind of thatched huts. And then the, the wildlife sanctuary is actually, you know, uh, in the back. Uh, and this is actually a, a trash heap <laughs> where, you know, you dump some of your plastic or, you know, other kinds of things uh, there. Um, so these are some of the Saharia children. Uh, as most anthropologists will tell you, uh, the kids will follow you around and they're curious you know, about what you're up to and they ask a lot of questions. Uh, here's a scene of this. So this is if you, if you walk you know, a couple of kilometers from that village area, for example, you get to this. So it's like a highland uh, village in the buffer zone of the sanctuary. So if you walk a little bit, uh, you get to these kind of you know, cliffs and you look down into this you know, vast sanctuary um, that these groups and uh, these groups are now excluded from and other groups uh, have been, they, they lived down in this more lowland area and they're not there anymore. They've been moved outside the, uh, the core and the buffer zone of this uh, sanctuary. Just another shot. It really is a, um, a, va a I mean it's not vast, it's a, I would consider it a relatively big you know, forest uh, uh, with a lot of ecological integrity as well. And that's one of the reasons why it was chosen as a site for something I'm going to talk about uh, in a moment and why these communities, these villages, uh, were moved out of there, about 20 villages. So just for example, here's a, so here's a fence that in key areas, um, I guess I could use my pointer just to get used to it here. <laughs> so in key areas, um, there's there's these these fences. It's not like it's, you know if you want to get beyond, you know by this fence, 
uh, you can. It's more of almost a symbolic marker that you know this is where the sanctuary is. You're not really supposed to go in uh, the sanctuary. You're not supposed to. You know, you're not supposed to go in it, and you're also not supposed to uh, harvest food, certainly not hunt, you know, not, you know, graze your, 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 your goat, you know, have your goats graze, uh, et cetera. Um, and remember, this is traditionally, this was exactly what you did. You would go into these areas uh, and do all that stuff, and now you uh, don't. Now, why were these, uh, why were these groups moved out? Uh, and this is... This is why, not this particular lion, but uh, lion. So there, there's actually, I don't know if you know this, but there's, um, there is a population of Asiatic lions. You all know this? There's like one remaining population of Asiatic lions. Do you, do you know where it is? I'm just curious if you're aware of this. So it's not just Africa you have lions. It's in India, yeah, and in, in the particular, <laughs> in the, good, good guess. Yeah, thank you, Samuel. Uh, and in the state of... Um, of Gujarat in the Gir uh, Sanctuary. So uh, as, as some of you more ecologically minded people will know, it's very, this is a valuable, you know, uh, it's a kind of, you know, one of these high profile, you know, species and, and you know, that, uh, and, and, and a kind of uh, valuable species from a conservation point of view. And if you have all of them in one place, they're vulnerable, right? So the, the government's idea is that we need to establish a second population of these Asiatic lions. So theoretically, this could be a win for conservation. If we can find a spot, you know, we move them there. Uh, unfortunately for the Saharia, their homes were the spot, right? Or at least some of these Saharia. Uh, so they got moved out of this uh, area. Now, the ironies are that, you know, the plan was from the late 90s, and that's when this kind of displacement event uh, started. It took a couple of years, and by early 2000s, uh, these communities have been displaced, and there are still no lions uh, in this in this place, right? Uh, and there might not be lions um, because um, the state of Gujarat, for example, doesn't want to give them up. So it's like a political event uh, because it's a big tourist revenue uh, and other kinds of things. Uh, so the plan now is uh, actually cheetah, <laughs> which also had a habitat. Uh, in, in India and throughout the Middle East, you know, for example. In India, they were signs of royalty, you know, for example. But there are no cheetah remaining in India, so these would be African cheetah. <laughs> I find this whole thing kind of, you know, I guess infuriating or at least ironic in, you know, in different levels. Um, I, I am going to talk about some ecological kinds of things, so let me just draw your attention to water is a big deal uh, and water scarcity. So this is like a, a common daily scene. So women will walk, you know, sometimes kilometers either to the one functioning uh, tube well in the village, which often isn't functioning. And so if it's not functioning, then you go to this other kind of water hole uh, that is generally has some water in it. Uh, but it's like it's, it's, for, it's for humans and it's for animals uh, and it's further away. Uh, but anyway, water is a big deal. Uh, and so I just wanted to draw attention to this. Uh, the way you gather water and so forth is gendered. And so it's typically women who make this trip several times a day. And this will, you know, you're carrying back to your home all the water you're going to use for, you know, for, for cooking and cleaning and, you know, washing and, you know, all sorts of things. Uh, this is a structure in the, in the, in the core of the sanctuary uh, that, is, that, is, that is now abandoned. Uh, so this is what I call uh, old Maziran. Uh, and then this is uh, new Maziran. So this is where the displaced villagers, this is one village. So I ended up visiting many, many villages, all the displaced villages, you know, like around 20, all these buffer zone villages, around five or six, but then in the end focused on a couple of them. So this is new Maziran, uh, and this is, this is another structure. It's actually a, a kind of uh, temple of a kind, and you see here, for example, you know, these, these, these kinds of flags are when you make a prayer uh, or a request uh, to the deity, uh, if, that, if that request is answered, then you uh, then you, you, know, you tie a flag there as a sign that the request has been answered. Okay, this is all just context. Let me get a little bit more into some of the findings uh, of the study. Okay, so the context is uh, in central India and in the state of Madhya Pradesh and kind of northwestern uh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, you have this wildlife sanctuary uh, and you have this core area and then you have this larger buffer zone area that I only show part of it here. And you have this old village here that's in the core, and you get moved out, to, out here. And then you have this other village here 
uh, that is that is still there, uh, Beruda, um, and um, and so these became a kind of focus. Um, now, if you saw in the title of that of the of the study, if you saw if you saw the title of that paper, uh, I'm really focused on uh, mental health or subjective well-being in the context of this of this right here and comparing these uh, to. Uh, these these two villages. Um, I refer to this as a uh, natural experiment, and you're going to see Suzanne is going to talk a lot more about this. So this is kind of a prelude to some of that. Uh, the idea being that these two villages, uh, Beruda and Maziran, um, you know, they they're a few kilometers away. Well, six or seven. It's not trivial, but they're you know relatively close. Uh, they have daily kinds of exchanges. They intermarry. They're economically bound together, socially bound together, et cetera. Uh, and so you have this event where one's displaced and the other isn't, right? So it's almost like a, it's like a, it's not a natural disaster. It's like a kind of human induced disaster of some kind with the, it's, and it's almost becomes like an experimental, you could call it like an experimental treatment effect, right? You have two, they're not, it's not random and there are some differences. I already told you one is more lowland. One is more upland, and they are a little bit apart, right? But they are, you know, genetically, you know, quite similar. I'm not going to say identical, but quite similar through intermarriage, et cetera. Demographically, quite similar. Same kind of mixed foraging, et cetera, kind of um, um, uh, uh, economy, right? And now one gets hit with this: you move here, you lose your home, right? And the other doesn't. You see what I mean by now? This is probably is this very familiar? This notion of a natural experiment. To, how many of you have heard of this? Okay, so almost everyone, it looks like. Look, for a typical cultural anthropological study, they, a typical anthropologist wouldn't do these kinds of things, right? But me, you know, I do, I do the ethnography and the observations, but then I'm always looking for ways to better identify causality, for example. So this is one of those instances where I say, oh, interesting. There's a kind of natural experimental human-induced disaster here. Let's see, in a, almost in a, in a more causal sense, what that did to people, right? Okay. So I can ask you, and I haven't told you a lot of context yet, so uh, don't worry. I think you're going to have a clear intuition on this, but I'm just kind of curious what you think. If we're looking at subjective well-being and mental health, and so remember, I'm not comparing old Maziran, but I'm comparing Baruda and new Maziran, right? Where would you expect the highest, the most positive kind of, the, you know, the, the strongest flourishing to be occurring? Uh, in Beruda or new Maziran? How many people think uh, Beruda, the highest flourishing? Okay. And how many people think new Maziran? Okay, I'm getting the same thing some of the other speakers had. A lot of you don't have an opinion yet. It's good. You're being careful scientists, right? And you want to withhold judgment. That's fine. Uh, some of you who think Baruda as having the highest uh, positive well-being, why? I'm curious your thinking. What's, what? Less change because change is stressful. Okay, so change is stressful. Now, this was an event. So the, a lot of the data collection was 2011, 12, and 13. So this was the event, the displacement event was 99 to 2001. So there is time to somewhat adjust. So maybe immediately afterward, that, I'm not saying I disagree with you, I'm just saying it's, time is an issue here, right? Uh, others thinking of, of why either you chose, you can say either one, either why you chose Baruda or New Maziran. Yes, that's all. Maybe it could depend also on the other Oh. Oh, that's. Have you read this, this paper? No, I well, very, very smart. That took me a long time to figure out in the field. I'm not saying it, it, it then means that they have higher or lower subject, but that is a, that's a huge factor. There's actually a kind of a secondary displacement. Before I did the ethnography, my intuition, well, you lose your home, and um, um, it's, it's terrible. I mean, you're a refugee, you're an internally displaced person, and you know, what could be worse than that? Uh, and, I'm, and it is bad. Um, but there are these secondary effects, and one of the big ones is what happens if all your neighbors <laughs> leave, right? 
all your net, so all 20 villages here, some in the buffer zone, and then because when these people leave, maybe even some of the other buffer zone is not as long or as, as interesting to be there. Uh, so there's tremendous cultural economic loss, right? Um, when you're isolated, what else can happen? Maybe you have ideas, maybe you don't. Well, okay, maybe you don't know, but I learned this through ethnography. When you're a vulnerable village in the middle of nowhere, the Indian state ignores you. <laughs> who's going who's gonna to know? We, don't, we said we're going to build it too well. We didn't. Who knows, right? Um, there are predatory, I mean, predatory maybe is too strong a word, but there, there are very, very you know, dominant, wealthy, herding cats from other parts of India, especially Rajasthan, a state I love. <laughs> but they come in there with all their camels and all their goats and their water buffalo, and they trample your, your fields, and they harass you. Uh, it turns out there are bandits in the area. There were some high-profile kidnappings where I, where I was there of some school teachers, for example. And who can, who, you know, there's, there's less kind of state control and, and good and bad, right? There's more criminality, right? Um, and remember, you lost access in Baruta to the core. So, um, you can't do a lot of things that you, and there's a big river there that you don't no longer have access to, fishing. Okay, so can I ask you again? <laughs> okay, so, and maybe I'm biasing, I'm being tricky here, I, I, you know, because there's maybe an intuitive, but then, and maybe you want to be smart, you want to be counterintuitive, but now you have a little bit more information. So there's like loss of home over here, but then there's other secondary stuff here. So who thinks that the, the highest flourishing would be in Beiruta? Oh, well, now no one? OK. And then what about uh, New Maziran? And, and we're still getting a skewed sample. OK, more people in New Maziran. Well, it turns out the highest flourishing is actually in Beiruta. <laughs> so we had a lot of measures. But, but let me just let me pause here for, for a moment. Because I think this is important the way I think about um, how I do anthropology these days. Uh, there's a kind of more exploratory and then a more confirmatory phase. Via the ethnography, I learned so much. And when I say ethnography, maybe that's unfamiliar. Maybe we'll have a little more time to talk about that. But I mean, over I started, I started in 2007 or 8 coming to this area. And so every summer or even you know, in some springs, I would come here and you spend a month, two months, and you travel, and you talk to people, and you do observations, you do interviews, you have a research team with you, and you slowly learn political, social, other processes, right? But the point is, Via ethnography, via ethnography, I learned so much. But I actually did not know the answer. I actually did not have a clear answer in my, in my head where I would see the most flourishing or, by contrast, compromised uh, mental health, right? So this is why I use what I would call more confirmatory methods. Confirmatory methods can be more kinds of observations, kind of more uh, systematically directed observations towards certain domains of experience, uh, along with structured interviews. It can be these even still qualitative methods, but it can also be things like a field survey uh, or a biomarker of a kind, for example, right? OK, so, so what we did was, um, uh, and when I say we, I have a team, and I'll show you a little bit of that uh, in a moment. Um, so we looked at a lot of measures, um, and we had a lot of scale. So in the confirmatory phase, we had this long survey that we constructed. We asked a lot of different kinds of things. Uh, and we had various indices for assessing uh, mental health and well-being. One was a, a translated into Hindi. So these are very, they're dialects of Hindi, you know, you could say. So I, I learned Hindi when I was a grad student, and, and I speak Hindi. And I also have, you know, field assistants working with me who um, are, are there for when you have to be really precise, like on a survey, for example, who are administering the surveys, which is it's better if they do it than if I do it, uh, right? But anyway, so we, we translated like a Hopkins uh, depression anxiety scale, so like a short version, like 10 items, six like depression items and four uh, anxiety items. But, it, but you know, that raises the question, and this is, this is kind of getting to one of the more central points that I'll be developing today. Um, you know, okay, an anxiety depression scale 
where there's really no exact equivalent, there's no really word for depression. I mean, there is like duk and utsav and sadness, for example, and there are a lot of symptoms that might look a lot like depression, but they don't, they don't talk about depression. There is this weird syndrome called tension, which is actually an English word that was brought in by the, the British, which is, looks like a kind of stress condition, and Bonnie Kaiser and Joe Weaver and others have written on that. I've written on that as well. So tension is interesting, but it's not depression. What is it? You know, how do you know? Okay, we're gonna get to that. <laughs> but anyway, it's like, okay, so this depression anxiety scale, right? So that's one, one version. Um, and then, uh, then we have this Brad, but then it's like, okay, but, may, but this is South Asia. So we go one step further. The Bradford Somatic Index. Uh, it was developed for a kind of alternative to more somatic. Has it, who's heard of this, the Bradford Somatic? Oh, wow, okay, great. Yeah, it's, like a, it's developed actually in Pakistan. Uh, and it's a kind of, it's another scale. Uh, in that paper, if you're interested, I talk about all this, right? So it's in that paper, uh, all these scales and measurement issues, et cetera. So I'm talking in a more schematic way right now. Um, but the Bradford Somatic Scale is, it's a more, okay, maybe in South Asia, depression is more somaticized. It's expressed through these bodily complaints more than mental or subjective complaints. And so there's another scale called uh, the Bradford Somatic Scale that we also used. Um, but, but then I'm thinking, but that's, oh, come on, urban Pakistanis, and this is like central India, Adivasi communities, you know, et cetera. Better, but still not good enough. So what do we do? We build our own scale as well. And that's where we use uh, these free listing techniques that I'm gonna show you uh, in a moment. Um, of um, The prompt in this case, I'll go ahead and give it to you now, uh, but I'll talk about it more in a moment, is when things are going well or poorly in your life, what kinds of experiences uh, or you, know, you have to like fiddle with it a little bit. What kinds of experiences do you have in your mind and your body? And then sometimes we said what kind of emotions. And then you, you can kind of clarify, people like, you know, what do you mean? And you use different words. You try to codify that across the, the free list uh, interviewers. But anyway, so what kind of you know emotions, positive and negative, loosely do you have when things are going well or poorly in your life, your family? And, you know, we said like in, in your own life and in, in your family's uh, lives. Uh, and people would list things, and you take the most common kinds of items. So I'll talk more about that in a moment and give you some more fl flesh on that, put some more flesh on that. Um, uh, but at this point, on pretty much every indice, Baruta was higher. Um, so, so in terms of flourishing, sorry, let me be very clear. They're, 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 they're doing better, so they're flourishing more. So less depression, less anxiety less you know, somatic depression-like symptoms, more balance of positive compared to negative uh, affect. Okay, but then the next thing, so that's, that is what we found, and I would call that confirmation of some ethnographic uh, kinds of insights. Uh, but the next thing is why. You know, you can, I was thinking, okay, we have the survey data, and we have a lot of material and other kinds of livelihood kinds of things, and then we also have these mental health outcomes. You know, what kinds of associations uh, can we find? I'm curious if you have a good, any, any kind of idea, what kinds of things would you expect to kind of predict or be associated across these two villages, uh, be associated with some of these mental health outcomes? Do you have a sense of that? I mean, there are literatures on this, like on refugees and displacement. I'm just curious, do any of you have a, a sense of that? Relationships and connectedness. Yes, yeah, so social support is a big one, and we found very clear patterns, you know. And again, you have to find the meaningful way to ask about that. So it's, it's things like we learn, and we kind of adapted the scale, like when you have a problem, you know, do you have people to go to uh, for food? Or people to you know, take care of your kids, you know, or give you a loan, uh, or you know, help you out when you're ill, right? And so there's a clear relationship between social support, for example, uh, and these subjective well-being indices. Anything else? Quality of housing. Uh, yeah, housing is tricky, and this is another thing where ethnography is very important because one thing in Maziran, everyone got the same house. <laughs> and everyone got the same amount of land, pretty much. I'll, maybe I'll qualify that in a moment. There's irrigation, you're close to a river or not, so there are, but it's a good idea, and, and that is a thing that we have, the, in, at least in, uh, in Beiruda, we have things like, um, yeah, do you, do you live in a kutcha, like a kind of shack, or do you have like a cement base, which is considered better and higher status? And yeah, so that's another good one. Other kinds of things? 
Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get to that in a moment. That's, that's the obvious one. It's like kind of livelihoods and material livelihood and SES, right? That's tricky, so I'm going to save that. But that's a good one and certainly something we are looking at, right? Well, that's ends up, I think, being the key one. It's hard. How do you ask that, right? So I'm going to, I have, I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Yeah, Samuel. I wonder if generation may be a factor, you know, Age, about yeah. Cultural dissonance as well. So it's probably really productive to have, a, you know, if everybody's the same in the village and you outsource your expectations to that community, it's fine. But for those younger people who may relate more to the dominant uh, culture. In yeah, no, there are age is another good one. So I think there are, you know, gender and age, and maybe those are important in their own right, and maybe there's some kind of interaction across villages. Those are certainly important. But did you find that, that maybe younger people? Yes, there there is a kind of age effect. Well, it turns out that the young people maybe they want to be displaced. <laughs> maybe you're near a market and you're near more where the action is, and you, maybe you're earning a little more. It's easier to migrate for wage labor, etc. Yes, Anna. Yeah. The fact that yes. someone who's younger takes on an ability to adapt and an ability to make use of that change and the consequences for interpersonal relationships of that. Yes. The family structure. Yes. Yeah, no, those are, I totally agree. So age is, is a very important one. So certain demographic factors, yeah. So as the career of the stress, so you were already okay. distressed before the moment of how the year after. Good point. Yeah, good point. Yes. Well, you guys are lots of ideas, yeah. I don't think you can look at this in terms of causal inference, though. I mean, you don't have a functioning for it. Uh, yeah. They were always. That's true, yeah. Well, so reviewers have certainly pointed this out to, <laughs> to us, right? And this is the thing that natural experiments, uh, they kind of fall prey to. So there are different kinds of experiments. So do you have pre experimental measures? You know, something I'm going to talk about telomeres in a moment. Was there a mortality selection? So this is why I wouldn't say experiments are, natural experiments have exactly the same uh, quality. They get closer, I think, to causality with some uh, careful interpretation, I think. But it's a good point. Um, OK, so let me just let me wrap this up and then and move on a little bit. Look, the point is, well, two you didn't mention, food and water, ins food and water insecurity. I guess maybe you're thinking food, ins food insecurity is related to SES, maybe in part. Um, but food and water insecurity turned out to be huge. Uh, and you kind of have to know how important water is, both for just drinking water and for your animals and also for farming. But those were huge. But here's the point I want to make is that we did, we had all these material livelihood kinds of uh, predictors. Uh, and then we also had some other kinds of social kinds of change kind of predictors. And we ran many, many regressions. And almost invariably things behave, uh, you know, kind of as you would expect. Uh, as I expected after the ethnography, especially with our own great, you know, positive and negative affect scale. Um, but no matter what regression we ran, village remained a predictor, always. Now, not on depression and anxiety, sometimes depression and anxiety and other kinds of negative subjective well-being can be quite well predicted by material livelihood and other kinds of standard things. But happiness, and we had questions about spiritual flourishing, for example, um, you could, it was, you know, Baruda was always doing better on the highest flourishing dimension, no matter what controls we put in. And we, so in a sense, you couldn't explain it away by some other secondary factor, such as, and especially, and this is the important point, especially a material and livelihood factor. Because remember, this is in the context of the Indian state saying, look, we paid you for this move. We paid you quite well. We gave you a new house. We gave you farmland. We built you wells. We helped find you jobs, right? And maybe all that is the case, right? There's certainly corruption in this context, but there's certainly some truth to that, right? But, but there's something remaining about that loss of homeland that is irreducible, I would say, right? to these other kinds of factors, which I think was a real, a real finding you know, here. It was really interesting to me, especially on like, you know, happiness, spiritual flourishing, um, et cetera. 
this is kind of a side note, but I just want, I want to draw your attention to a complexity here. Because um, SES was mentioned. How do you measure SES in a context like this? <laughs> and, and let me give you, because this is something, oh, SES. Oh, yeah, gen okay, maybe gender is more straightforward. They're getting more complex these days, but maybe not less so in these, you know, in these contexts. But SES, I mean, come on, it's not like you, you don't have a salary job. No one in these villages has a salary job. In, in the displaced village, a few. But in, certainly not in, in Beruda. Um, education, what would you expect for education here? A fifth grade education, like a primary school education, is a great luxury. And actually, education was another really good predictor. Uh, liter yeah, exactly right, Laura. Yeah, yeah, basic literacy. I think that's the explanation. But if you have basic literacy, now there are other endogenous you know, variables. Maybe your family's doing better. You know, what were the circumstances that allowed you to get that education? So again, I'm careful with the causal language here, right? Um, but education is a great predictor of positive sub subjective well-being. And my sense is it's about uh, basic literacy. But, yeah, Samuel. Are you first trying to look at SES um, sort of within village variation before looking at things like the broader context of India? Well, I'm not even thinking about the broader context of India. I'm really thinking about two villages where things are a little bit different. But you could look in the broader context of India. But let me, what, do you have a question behind well, I'm that? I'm wondering, like, yes, within those communities, what are some known markers of high those status, for example, or very yeah. Yeah, yeah, but how do you figure that out? So there are things like, again, like, you know, free listing. You know, what, what kinds of features does a high, you know, a high quality individual, I mean, a high status individual have? But let me just, okay, so let me just give you a little bit of the complexity here. And this is a kind of a side note. Um, so foraging of gum and resin. So you scrape the, you own these trees, you inherit them from your family, uh, and you scrape them, and you collect this gum. Um, mouse. <laughs> I think it's obvious on these photos, but you never know. Uh, and then you collected about four or five different kinds of gum used for medicines or edible oils or plastic manufacturing. There are merchants who come and they put the, you, know, you put these in big bags and you sell them by the kilo. That's a good source of income. Uh, you also are doing a lot of wild foraging still now in the buffer zone of kind of a wild spinach here. Very tasty, right? But how do you, how do you quantify that, right? Informal foraging economy. How do you even know what they're foraging? Do you see where I'm going with this? It's like, well, OK, maybe everyone is what I would call a cultural domain. You know, what are, plant, what are, what are, what are the valuable plants that you forage from the forest? That's a free listing activity. But then they're like, well, what do you mean by valuable? Oh, yeah, you're like, well, the ones you eat, <laughs> the ones you use for medicine, the ones you sell, you know, right? See what I'm saying? And then, and, then, and then the next step is, OK, you get the list and the most salient items. Which ones do you actually collect? And how much, right? How much you earn from them? You're not earning anything from them, but you're getting them, and they're helping you in various ways, right? So uh, but it's even more complex. Yeah? Can I come back a little bit to religious? So yeah. Religious, are you talking about, for example, a language proficiency in their own community? Oh. No, I'm talking about, no, no, so they have, uh, so they have, India has this, you know, kind of ambitious program. We're going to have a primary school in every single village. <laughs> so when I say literacy, all I mean is you, it's, they call it f like fifth grade pass. <laughs> I pass the fifth grade, whatever, it's a bureaucratic, administrative. You qualified, it has nothing to do with, I mean, there are poets in these villages, and there are people who are very, they're storytellers. I mean, they're very, you know, orally literate. That's a weird phrase, but you know what I mean? Because liter literacy comes from, like, the notion of writing down things. But anyway, um, uh, um, but, um, yeah, so it really is just you passed fifth grade. Now, I think, but, but still what that means is you can read, there, a document circulates from the government. You can pretty much read it. You can sound things out, and people might help you with a word if you don't know it, right? And you can sign things, right? So you can participate more in state structures, right? Let me, do, let me be clear one thing, though. The kinds of populations I'm talking about, when you know, the, 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 the topic of you know, the weird populations, the Western-educated, industrialized, rich, democratic populations, you know, I'll see these world value studies. <laughs> oh, you know, we've, we found you know, India is like this, or you know, you know, Asia is like this, or China, or you know, whatever. And I'm always asking myself, <laughs> 
you know, are the Saharia included in these world value studies? Even there was a recent really good one that came through, and it's like 80 countries. And I was reading the abstract, and it's like, oh, but, you know, mo you know in parentheses, most of our respondents were, uh, were college students. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, I don't want to be too harsh. It's like, that's pretty good, 80 countries, you're getting out, but then what about the Saharia, right? And not just, so when we're talking about, you know, the kind of universalism and kind of generalizing a kind of uh, universal psychology, universal values with some kind of variation, are we still talking about largely literate, wealthy, democratic, you know, urban kinds of population or not? So that's just kind of a side note. And not just on economic issues like I'm talking about here, um, but uh, many other kinds of issues, right? You know, values and belief and practice, et cetera. But anyway, they also they do monsoon-fed irrigation. So they don't have irrigated farms typically. But during the monsoon season, uh, you know, the rains come in and you've planted these seeds and you plowed them. And maybe you have a kind of a water pump that pumps in water from a local pond, you know, for example. But that takes money and resources, et cetera. So you also farm. Should I have any more slides? Yeah, I'll save that. Um, the point is um, that you're a farmer, but crops fail. <laughs> and the camels eat your crops and they stomp them down. And the rains fail. Uh, you're also a, a, a migrant laborer, so when you know peanuts and cotton are being harvested, maybe that's a good time to leave. And then maybe you're doing your, sur your, your survey at that time, and there's a kind of sampling bias, right? The point is, even something is what my scene is straightforward is SES is actually quite uh, uh, complicated. I'm not going to solve it here. It turned out that um, some of the, the 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 measures that were showing patterns as we predicted, one was a very simple. Uh, how well off are you compared to other Saharia that you know? And it was like one, two, three. <laughs> you know, like poor, doing okay, wealthy. I'd have to, yeah, in the material domain. Yeah, I have to look at exactly, I mean, I have, you know, this was 2011, I have to look at exactly, but it's, but the, the point is, is like, if you think you're doing less poorly than others in your context, um, um, that can you know, have an effect on it. it can be you know related in interesting ways to subjective well-being. Is symbolic capital correlated with financial? Well, that's the thing is I was going to give a little wrinkle there, but one thing we found was that um, um, in Maziran, people tended to say, even though they were actually objectively seemingly, because we also had like uh, we had them estimate like crops and crop earnings, and we had them estimate wage labor. And, and, and they, we had land estimates, at least in Beirut, if not in, in, uh, you know, in, in, in Maziran, where land was pretty equivalent. But we had irrigated land. Irrigated land worked pretty well. Um, but in Maziran, where by many, my, by many standards was actually objectively wealthier, people would often subjectively say we're less, doing less well. On, on average, the mean is lower than in Beirut. Now, why would that, uh, do you have a sense of why that is? So in Maziran, the displaced village, you're saying, I'm not doing well, even though by objective standards, you're doing well. You're more likely to make that, you know, to, to, to kind of make that I mean, mistake, <laughs> not a mistake, but, a, you know, that kind of judgment. Versus in Beirut, where you might even overestimate your financial livelihood well-being, even though you're not doing as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, Lisa. We were talking before about the, uh, the spiritual well-being, right? So the relationship to the place, the ancestral land. Uh, how is the um, uh, ritual component of pop life? Music? I'm going to get to that. I have a little segment on ritual. So let me. I'll sa can I save that for? It's very important, and it's there's a paper I'll show you in a moment. Yeah. Yes. Maybe there's a greater variation of wealth in the Ruda than there is in. Uh, so, if there's a greater variation, you would probably. Because you kind of, like, if you're asked subjective wealth, how wealthy do you think you are? You're comparing yourself to other people in your community. So if everyone is more or less similar to you, then you might not say you're really rich or really poor. Yeah, that's, you're on exactly the right track. That's exactly what we found. I would, I would give a little bit of a caveat is that um, the key is that for the Maziran displaced villagers, you're moving toward other caste Hindus who are often quite wealthy or a lot wealthier than not wealthy by Indian standards, a lot wealthier than you are, right? So the variation is actually more in that Maziran context. And then the subjective assessment 
is you're making an assessment toward these wealthy caste Hindus and you're comparing and you're saying, oh, well, I'm not like them, right? So you have a greater kind of frame of reference, right? But you see the point, because I don't want to get, this is not the main focus here, but you see that SES, all these variables that you might have a sense of cannot be readily measured in these, it takes a little fiddling. Uh, I just want to make a, a couple points is this is a team, and if any of you are planning on doing things like this, so I have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Chakrapani Upadhyay, who's one of my main uh, field collaborators. Uh, and these are now, you know, these are some of his students uh, and postdocs who are now, they've been working with me and Dr. Chakrapani uh, since uh, 2005, you know, on a first project that I'm not talking about today in, in Rajasthan in these Bil uh, tribal uh, areas. Um, and they're the, they're, the, they're, the, they're the field researchers, they're the collaborators who are distributing the survey, field testing the survey. You can't do this alone, right? Uh, and Chuck Rapani is, is he's a brilliant guy and a brilliant field worker <laughs> and, a, and a friend, right? And, and there's a warmth to him that you know, helps on every level, right? So it just helps to have, so these are my middle class. You know, I, we, we, we move from Udaipur <laughs> into, you know, for them it's an adventure. It's high adventure. You know, they're middle class educated Indians. And they're like, oh, we're going to these tribes. They're a little nervous, you know. And during, I'm going to talk about Holi, this Feast of Holi uh, that I'm going to talk about in a moment. They all hid inside this. They closed themselves off inside this, uh, the school, and they locked the door because <laughs> they didn't want because they they were worried about things that could happen. And I'll, maybe I'll say a little bit more about that, right? Um, now this is, I know, that I, I debate about whether to show this photo, uh, but this is me, <laughs> this is me with, now, because I want to make a few comments here that are actually kind of interesting comments. Uh, and I know this looks kind of colonial and weird and, and all that, but, but it's like, um, they were very protective of me. So I want to go out and explore, <laughs> you know, I want to I explore the, you know, the, uh, uh, yeah, you're not, I shouldn't say too much about going into the center of the, I, you know, sometimes we get official permission, we go hike into the center of this, you know, wildlife sanctuary, right? Um, but, but they're like, no, 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 you can't, you can't do that. They're, you know, they're bandits. And there were, like I said, there were high profile uh, kinds of um, uh, kidnappings, uh, for example, of these school teachers and ransoms and so forth. Um, but there's not, there's no gun culture in India. Do you know that there's no gun culture? In India? No, no one has a gun, <laughs> right? But these tribals, these Adivasi communities in this Wasang, they were gifted guns by the government because they killed, they actually killed, this is a weird story, but they killed this high profile bandit that was kind of terrorizing the region. Uh, and, and then it became this news story. This was, you know, maybe 20 years ago. Uh, and they, and they, it, so it was brought to attention how they were suffering at the, at the hands of these depredations. And so the government granted them these, I don't think they're very well functioning, <laughs> but they're like these kind of blunderbuss, you know, shotguns uh, to protect them, to protect themselves. Now it's tricky because in a wildlife center, you can imagine, you know, from the state's point of view, this could be misused and used for hunting, et cetera. No, I won't make any comment on that. Um, so anyway, when I was wandering, you know, with them, they would always, I'd have a, like kind of an armed guard, <laughs> right, with me into the, you know, even the water hole. And this is a big, the, the reason I bring this up, because this is an important issue, because it shows the kind of vulnerability. These are not just imagined kinds of vulnerability. Women in particular, when they go to this water hole, they're afraid of, of, of outsider men, whether they're bandits or not, who might harass them. Uh, assault them, you know, in various ways. Uh, and then these groups are afraid of a lot of these outsiders, um, and they, not just bandits, but other more dominant communities that can pretty much do, you know, what they want. So this is actually a real issue that, that pointed to some vulnerabilities. Okay, I'm, I'm going to speed up a little bit. I was hoping by, so we've gone about 50 minutes, and I was hoping by the, a little after an hour, I can move to the uh, virtual worlds, but I, I still have some things I want to say here. <clears throat> but I will start speeding up a little bit. Um, when we tell this story <laughs> to the Indian government, I work closely with the Forest Department, they're like, well, these are just what people are telling you. Because again, these are like subjective measures, you know, self-assessments of how well you're doing and mental health. It's kind of fluffy, right, from certain points of view. It's like, it's not really objective. So what we decided to do was we wanted to look at actually uh, something quite different on a bio biological level to again, in this natural experimental kind of context, assess the impact of, uh, of displacement on telomere length. And some of you may, you know, are maybe aware of this literature, but telomeres uh, are understood to be this little protective cap uh, that sits on the ends 
of your chromosomes and serves a kind of protective function uh, uh, against degradation with the idea that if the telomere somehow becomes uh, degraded, then there's risk of your DNA, your functional DNA, also becoming degraded. So some people uh, have proposed that uh, telomeres are almost like a chronometer, like your tel telomere length you know, associated with uh, your, your actual age can kind of tell you, are you aging in a, in a, in a more accelerated or more de decelerated uh, fashion? So we actually worked with uh, Susan Bailey, uh, who's a telomere scientist uh, uh, at CSU, and she and David Marinon, who was her postdoc, they gave us this. And I'm, I'm telling you this because this is a little behind the scenes stuff. I don't know a lot about telomeres. I mean, I learned a lot because I, you know, want to know things. But the, the protocol and how you collect them, et cetera, you know, I learned from Susan Bailey, right, and her postdocs. And so there's a nature protocol that tells you the kinds of alcohol to bring and the kinds of tubes. And we ended up collecting mouth buckle cells where you're scraping the inside of the cheek. Uh, and um, with a little child's toothbrush, <laughs> And then you have like alcohol in a, you know, a vial, and then you put the, yeah, you, you've done this, Laura. Really? Yeah, yeah and then you, you break, yeah, interesting, yeah. And you, know, you break it off and you seal it and you ship it. We, in this case, we did ship it or you carry it. Uh, but each, each biomarker that you use has its own protocol, and you need, so I'm an anthropologist. I need, you know, I need a biologist. And specifically, a telomere biologist to tell me how to do this, you know, correctly, because these are these are, you know, these are biochemicals. In the study I'm going to talk about, we thought about using oxytocin, but it turns out in the field conditions that I was in, oxytocin is it's too big and a fragile uh, molecule, and we couldn't do it, right? Even though we would would have very much liked to, right? So anyway, we collected. So we, you know, we had these uh, these medical professionals come out from the um, um, from the um, the district, and so we collected a lot of you know medical data, heart rate, pulse, blood pressure, BMI, all that kind of stuff, uh, and we did a kind of more biocultural analysis on telomere length. Now I can ask you again, if where would you think would have the kind of more accelerated harmful telomere degradation? Do you think that confirmed our subjective well-being story or not? I mean, I'm just curious. Do you have any intuition on that? Maybe you don't. Do you have a sense of would that displaced village, uh, you know, Maziran or that non-displaced village have the longer uh, telomere? Maziran is shorter. Yeah, and, and that's what we found. Yeah, how much shorter? This is uh, this is like these are terrible questions. <laughs> so it turned out it was like when you control for all this. Other, first of all, we did find we use we looked at cortisol. I'll talk about it in a moment, and salivary am amylase. You know, par, you, know, you know, the autonomic nervous system and also this HPA axis, you know, stress system. And we did find associations between these two well-known stress um, uh, molecules uh, and telomere length, which is good. You know, you certainly, and then we also, Bradford somatic, you score higher on the Bradford somatic, you know, uh, symptom syndrome, for example. And you also have uh, uh, shorter telomeres, right, more somaticized kind of depression, uh, for example. Um, so I'll name him because he, you know, Guljar, he was one of my respondents. Uh, he wanted a souvenir. He wanted one of these little vials because, you know, it's very, it's very tight. You, he, I, I love this guy. I mean, you got, you're meeting him every day and he wants to do it right and he's spitting. This is not the buckle cells. This is the cortisol. We also collected salivary, you know, uh, uh, we did salivary uh, uh, cortisol uh, analysis, right? So we have these little vials and we arrive every morning over like a, you know, like an eight or nine day period, and you know, here they are, you know. Sometimes I think our Jeeps would wake people up, you know. Uh, in, this was in Mazian, we're staying in the, in the, 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 the forest village, right? Uh, so anyway, we, you know, we did this kind of stuff. Um, just a couple slides here, storage is very important because and this is, again, a little bit behind, you don't, maybe you don't think about this stuff. There's not electricity, <laughs> there's not electricity in, uh, uh, in Beruda. There is in Maziran, but it's intermittent. It's just, does cortisol need to be in a refrigerator? Does it need to be, for, does oxytocin? I didn't know before, I'm like, I'm gonna do this and you wanna do it right, right? So it turns out cortisol, you know, spit is, it's kind of okay uh, at, uh, at, at room temperature. 
but it's better cold and even better frozen. So we use, we have this refrigerator with a little freezer, <laughs> right, and then these ice packs. You know, and we would store our samples in this little, and then it was powered by a diesel driven generator that became my enemy and kind of the bane <laughs> of my existence because it, you know, you're on a budget from NSF and it's like, well, I think we can get the cheaper diesel generator and it's second hand and it's half the cost and then, and then I can, you know, give more respondent gifts and have funds to do other kinds of things. Well, that was, in hindsight, was not a, <laughs> a great idea because, you know, the generator would clunk out. And then we're in the middle of the forest, so you got to drive like 20 kilometers and try to find a mechanic who can fix it. So, and it turns out cortisol, one thing it is sensitive to, and so I'm giving you the behind, I don't think we mentioned this in the article, but cortisol is sensitive to thaw and refreezing. Mm -hmm. And so, you, you know, we kind of seal this up and have the ice and kind of pray, you know, that we're, you know, we're going to see what we think we're going to see and we're not going to get too much noise. Um, religion, and then I'm going to turn to a little exercise and I'm going to pivot a little bit. Uh, so religious ritual is good med medicine for indigenous Indian conservation. I, I was not just interested in suffering. I was interested in uh, sources of resilience. And it turns out that religion uh, looks to be one of those. <laughs> so, I mean, just look at this. I love this photo. This is this, is this Mataji, this mother shrine, uh, just above this forest village. And you can see uh, this is actually the, the village uh, headman. Uh, and another individual we were traveling with, uh, you know, prostrating himself before in respect and a kind of relaxation and confidence and feeling of protection, et cetera, that you get, you know, from that kind of experience. This is deep stuff. This is not trivial stuff. This is like, this is protection. This is meaning. This is life, right? And so, so this was the comment I made, you know, even yesterday about global mental health. Um, you know, when you're looking for treatments, <laughs> why are you looking to like a CBT, cognitive behavioral intervention? Why not look to this? That's my question, right? I mean, doesn't this work? So we tested that. Uh, and now you can see that we have a lot of different, we have biomarkers. So we were collecting, so what we actually were collecting these biomarkers over two, like nine day periods during two ritual occasions. Um, one of them was Navratri, the nine days of the goddess. Um, and so these are, they're, you know, they're festive occasions where you're visiting like a fair <laughs> and you dress up and you eat well. And, it, and it's punctuated by uh, a kind of highlight where you're actually, it's this act of worship accompanied by the, the goddess and other deities descending into the medium's bodies, right? Which, you know, they're getting, the mediums are getting one kind of effect, but then you're in the audience and you're asking questions and you feel like God is with you and God has manifested him or herself. And so the idea is that, you know, if you're interested in these kinds of stress responses, this is giving a kind of rela relaxation, kind of stress alleviation response, kind of like what Amir Raj was talking about, you know, for example. And then the other one was holy. And so, uh, just for example, over the two days, you can have, uh, you know, first you destroy um, holika. You make this big effigy in the forest and you, you burn uh, this demon. Uh, it's all part of this uh, Ram and Ravan kind of st story. Uh, and then the next day you do the colors. Uh, and when I first was describing this, this project to some of my collaborators, I, I, I had an affiliation with the Indian Institute of Forest Manager, Management in Bhopal. And I was describing what I want to do. And I had all these possibilities of the rituals I could consider. And it, they had to be two rituals kind of close together. So they're not identical, right? Because one village, because I'm in one village, my team, and then I'm with an, in another village. And they're like, oh, yeah, you got to do holy. <laughs> and I'm like, OK, yeah. Because holy is like a festival of colors and laughter. And come on, if you don't see an effect from holy, you know, you're not going to see an effect, right? So, so that's what we did. So we did holy. Um, a lot of creativity. This was like this improvised uh, boom box with the DJs. And they would circulate the village, and they would sing and dance and chant and there was music and then they would get it was considered labor like payment so they would get paid um, um, for um, dancing and it's seen as a part of the kind of festival and singing and men and women both do it um, the finding was what do you think did we see improvement in all these psychobiological 
Uh, maybe I should just stop asking these questions. We did see an improvement in all these psychobiological uh, measures, uh, including cortisol, um, but also all you know, our positive and negative affects, all that stuff. Um, and I think I had, yeah, so, and it was dramatic. <laughs> So 34% post-ritual drop in anxiety across the two villages. Um, assessed via the Hopkins. Uh, improvements of 27%, 29%. This is just nine days. 27%, 29%, and 19% on our three health outcomes. Uh, dior diurnal cortisol slope, diurnal slope, uh, self-reported stress, and this positive and negative affect scale that I'm going to talk a little bit about. Um, I think this is remarkable, uh, and there's no psychiatric intervention that would have that kind of improvement uh, over such a short period of time. Now, I often get this question is like, well, how long does it last, right? Uh, yes, Bethany? Yes. What's the reduction in cortisol? Yeah, I'm going to talk a little about cortisol in a moment, so I'll explain that a little okay, bit more. I I'll say it. Yeah, I, I probably should have put those slides ahead of time, but I didn't, so I'll say something about that in a moment. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, you didn't. You didn't. You were paying attention, it sounds like. Um, now, one thing is I would say is I don't know if any of you noticed that my glasses are pink right here. Did you notice this? So when, uh, it, that was not a style choice. It could have been, but it was not. It was actually holy. <laughs> and the reason I, I raised that issue is because every time I see that, I'm like, I remember uh, this, this day, right, when I was drenched in those uh, color. Have I even shown that? Oh, I haven't shown that. Yeah, this day. Yes. Yeah, I remember this day. Those are the same glasses, right? So, but that's a weak answer to how long does this last. The strong answer is that if you know Hinduism, this is a kind of rejuvenating kind of, a, you know, there are these rituals that happen, not every day, but quite regularly, not this dramatic, but as a kind of uh, mental health, you know, intervention of some kind, uh, there's reason to think that this stuff is, 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 is it's, it, it would be long-lasting because of the nature of the way Hinduism works, uh, you know, if, according to the calendar. Um, I should say a, a few qualifications. We did more analysis than just that we saw improvements. We also saw things like uh, if you if you have more of a sense of uh, more of a sense of vulnerability, uh, uh, you the, there's a stronger effect. If you have more of a major mental health kind of uh, problem, uh, there's less of an effect. There's still an effect, but there's less of an effect. And that, to me, that's interesting, because in this particular paper, my team and I were arguing, look, this is more of a source of mental health uh, resilience, more of a protective function, than if you're major, you know, if you suffer from something that we, you know, is like major depression, you might not want to celebrate holy, you know, for example. Uh, just a, a little comment on cortisol. So we did look at, uh, the thing, so here's this molecule, but the thing we were interested in was this diurnal slope. So as we heard from the stress in the brain lecture, there's this cortisol awakening response here. And then when you're aroused in the morning, you know, you have a certain kind of response. Uh, and then uh, it, it kind of declines over the course of the day. Um, and so what we were actually seeing was an improvement in the slope. We couldn't get the cortisol awakening response because it was just too challenging to get there before people woke up. Not just because we don't wake up that early, but because there's actually irregular kind of waking up times during the day. Uh, and so what we did was we were looking at the slope over the course of the day. So the idea is over the course of the ritual, the idea is that a flat or a flatter slope, it's a, a kind of a less responsive kind of response. And so if you see a steepening, it's understood. It's, it's, it's a proxy, but it's understood to be a more responsive uh, cortisol system. Okay. Here's the pivot. Uh, I want to talk about one of the scales that we use. And this is where I'm getting to some of the stuff uh, that is, is of most direct interest. And I am going to uh, speed up just a little bit. But first, I want to do something different. Do you have, because I want to talk about cultural models. <laughs> it's gonna, do you have a clear image in your mind, or do you, are there words you could associate with Donald Trump? So I did this little exercise with my uh, my psychanthro class in 2016, right during the election, right before the election, 
in hindsight, it was a little bit of a mistake, and it was riskier than I thought it was going to be, 2016. But I did it, and I wanted to show them the kind of cultural models approach. I wanted to elicit a model of both Trump and also uh, Hillary Clinton. But I'm curious with Trump, what, could you, is anyone brave enough to list a word? That you might, okay, narcissist. Now, then I could ask you, do people, on one to five, is that a good word to describe Trump? Okay. Uh, other words? <laughs> okay, anyone else? What about Clinton? Narcissistic. Narcissistic, okay, okay, they're overlapping, okay. So we asked students, we, to be fair, we said try to think of a positive term and a negative term. And we collected, a, I was going to do this exercise in here, but we wouldn't have time. And I collected on the board all these uh, free lists. And let me jump out of this real quick and just show you a little bit where I'm going here. So, so we, we, I constructed this little Google Forms survey. And so with Trump, you can see some of the items here. And I'm, I'm just going to show you, this is Google Forms is a really intuitive little survey, very edible. There are many of these, and Kathy would be the pro on the next generation of this kind of field survey. But I found this very useful. And so we, I created this little uh, survey. Uh, and, it, you know, and I sent it to my students, and it comes out in this little form. And I want to focus on this right here. Remember, what we're interested in doing here is everyone has what I would call a personal model. You have like an opinion on Trump, and you could probably come up with items that you associate with Trump. But the, but the, but the question is, how much agreement is there among a sample that, that those could be good items, right? And so that's what, oh, yes, thank you. Sorry, you didn't see any of that. <laughs> you didn't see it. OK, I was just talking to the, anyway. You'll see this. But OK, so this notion of a personal model and a free list, you might have things that you associated with Trump uh, or with, with Clinton. But the idea is, do others share those beliefs with you? So this is the kind of exercise that, that I did. And I want to just run through these, because as you're going through it, I want to see, does this correspond? You'll, see, you'll get a sense of how this free listing technique works. And remember, we're taking free list and then making judgments about the most salient items. In a free list, you know, sampling is obviously very important. In this, in this case, it was just my class. And we're putting them on, on this little survey and then asking people a uh, rating task, right? OK, so you can see what my class said. So, and these are the terms, right? So outsider, is this going to work like this? Yeah, racist. Try to get a sense if there's a, do you think there's agreement, right? Oops. Businessman, sexist. Now, what are these terms again? Just remind me there, or remind yourself. It's my classes offered representation of items associated with Trump, right? That may form a kind of cognitive object that could be variably, that could be learned in some way through practice, and interaction, discourse, et cetera. Strong, not so much agreement there. There's, OK, narcissistic, blunt. Dumbass, okay. Not, not as much agreement as you might think, though, right? Law, or, you know, I guess there's. So that's the, the Likert scale, the strongly oh, yeah, yeah. Five is strongly agreed. Good. Thanks, Samuel. Yes. No, no, that's different. This is, just, uh, this is just a Likert is on that survey. Do you strongly agree that this is a term that correctly uh, identifies? To the free list. Then I, then I put it on that little field survey. And then I circulated the survey, and then students responded one to five whether they agreed, right? Loud. I am an uh, honest. OK, wow. Oh, not honest, right, yeah. Fear, unapologetic, brat. There's a beauty to this. And the reason I'm showing you this is because you don't know what's going to show up, right? And you can't say your respondents are right or wrong. It's their view, right? That's the cultural you know, domain, kind of uninformed, corporate, visionary, not, as, okay, not misogynistic, tough, radical, prince. That might have been my, yeah, well, anyway, again, I won't out that person. Uh, power, savior, no. <laughs> Childish, no nonsense, small fingered, 
totally <laughs> normal. <laughs> Speaks. Okay, this is going on a little longer, but let's change authentic punishment, incompetent discipline, not politician, not making America great again, rich, aggressive. Okay. Look, I'm showing you this, but the idea that I'm trying to, to communicate here is you could, I want you to think on your own projects, and maybe we could even talk about this this afternoon. Is there a schematic object that could be meaningful to your project, right? Um, and Clinton, do we want to run through Clinton, or we don't have a ton of time? Maybe, are you interested in Clinton? Yes. Of course, okay, this is, okay, it's interesting. Experienced, <laughs> crooked. This is actually interesting. It will help me make a point. Intelligent. But remember, any domain of inquiry, this is just, this is like what, what I call pre presidential candidates at this point. Lawrence? Well, what yeah. I wanted to ask is presumably within this, these things are correlated in certain ways uh, yeah. among certain individuals. Yeah, oh, yeah, for sure. Positions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so yes. That kind of cluster and say, look, here are two or oh, three yeah. models that are at play. Yes, that yes, in. yes, yeah. We de I'll say something about that, yeah. The devil, wow. That's strong. Educated. A traitor. That's strong. Understanding. Oops, I skipped one. Liar. Tough. Guilty. So are these words I collected from newspapers or from where? No, no, it was a free list. I asked, the prompt was, what are words that you associate, good and bad? From my class. From my class. My class, we did it. They, they wrote on a little piece of paper so they didn't have to out their own political. So they'd write it down, and then my grad students and I would get up on a board, right? Two faced. There are clustered themes, so committed people, it's their word, I don't know. <laughs> uh, feminist, empathetic, fascist, strong, evil. Reasonable. Khaleesi. Do you even know what that, that's like? Game of Thrones, right? Yeah, yeah. Strong woman leader, right? Mother of dragons. Mother. <laughs> Corrupt. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move on. But you get the idea, right? So look, let me let me make one point. Is we actually did a consensus analysis, and overall, there's strong consensus on Trump. Overall, there's consensus across the two candidates, but when you do them individually, there's strong consensus on Trump. We did factor analysis, cluster analysis, et cetera. Um, and there's like one Trump dimension. <laughs> He's like, Trump is Trump, was our interpretation. Hillary, not consensus, and more dimensions. And it was actually kind of interesting. It, to me, it was a kind of window into, Trump is someone I understand, I have a very clear model of, and him maybe less so. Uh, as Lawrence uh, suggested, we did collect a lot of demographic this was just an exercise. I don't want to get too serious about it. Um, but we had demographic, political affiliation. I won't even show it. We had demographic affiliation, uh, et cetera, uh, that oops, that behave predictably, Republican, Democratic, uh, et cetera. OK, let me continue. Now. The last minute, some. This is probably the most important part of, of the talk, because um, I want to I want to pivot a little bit. Um, all that context and all that stuff I told you about the Sahara. A lot of the success of those analyses were the fact that we built up. We did a free list. As I told you this, right? We did a free list on emotions, right? Remember, the positive and negative affect scale, correct? Mm -hmm. That became the key instrument on all those analyses. And I hope you see it's not that different. It's the, the process is the same. The Trump-Clinton, it just depends on what your uh, cultural, it could be pa parenting, right? You're, we were talking yesterday, like an ideal model of parenting, and maybe that plays into, even a, a stricter parenting model, maybe that plays into maybe not necessarily negative of well-being, right, for kids. Maybe it's seen as engagement of some kind. I'm not saying in a certain cultural context, right? 
But the point is, so we did this for emotions, and this was very important to the studies. And we got a lot, I could go into a lot of detail here, but at this point I'm just going to say, well, you know, this, this free listing technique and other kinds of related techniques allowed us to get a set, you don't just translate depression, you get a set of meaningful emotional experiences. Then you can ask, well, how often do you have a desire to work during the day? And I mean, you have to phrase the question correctly, right? Uh, there are a lot of desire, desire to work, desire to meet people, desire to move around, desire to eat. They're not really, remember, it wasn't exactly emotions. It's things that when you're feeling good, you know, what kinds of, you know, things do you feel in your mind and your body, right? Um, so just as one example, that measure behaved very appropriately when we were doing analyses on, here's Maziran, the displaced village. The balance of positive to negative is the lowest, right? Positive to negative emotions is the lowest, right? That's what we expected. Then there's Beiruta. These are both displaced peoples of a kind, the kind of primary displacement and the secondary displacement. These are not displaced villages, but here's one suffering from more deforestation, and here's one suffering from little deforestation, so less ecological degradation. The point, all the point I want to make here is that it behaved very, ex, in a very expected uh, fashion. We did do like cluster or kind of factor analyses on these items, so we did the, the all the positive items, for example, and we, you know, had a somewhat complex um, solution here. Um, but, you know, the feeling of being fit and fine, a kind of just well-being in your body and your mind is kind of a first factor. Feeling of light, desirous, I mentioned that. These are the kind of components of those. Yes? Yeah, yeah, when, and I have to go, the, the exact words are important, but when things are going well or poorly in your life, what kinds of things do you feel in your mind and your body? And I've had scholars say, you know, can I adjust, you know, I, mean, I want to use this, can I adjust? Of course, you've you got to find the right prompt, right? This was, we were just kind of experimenting around. You can adjust it and find the right prompt for getting these emotions, right? Uh, so social the desire, you know, feeling connected to others and then upright. One point I would make here is this does not correspond that closely to a Western diagnosis, right? Diagnostic, you know, kind of nosology in a way. Uh, the negative items were things like tense. I used tense even though it wasn't the highest loading item because there is this tension, uh, you know, kind of uh, understanding in this part of the world, uh, a feeling of weakness you know, kind of drain, low energy. I mean, we called it suffering, but that, uh, originally I was like, well, it's like depression, but it's like the, the, the kind of emotional side of depression rather than the somatic uh, side of depression. But you can see the items here, suicidal, like crying, lonely. Uh, craving, it was a single item. Sometimes you're not supposed to use single items, but we did that in that case. Um, I have this idea that if you do, if you break down emotional suffering to these kinds of components, uh, you can actually, um, you can actually start to see things, structures of things at different levels, symptoms clustering together, clusters of symptoms either getting named or not getting named that can form an interesting kind of dialogue uh, with a Western uh, nosology. Another shift of direction. I just have a few minutes, so I'm just going to say I'm, I am going to present a scale, but then we're, uh, we're almost at. We have another, it looks like 10 minutes, 8 minutes. So I'm going to just say, I'm going to show you how we did a similar things in the context of virtual worlds, and then I'll have to stop. So let me, do, I'm just going to skip that. So we did the, the article I had you read, and if you, if you really want to get into how to do this in a kind of consensus framework, and what is consensus and what's the literature, this would be the article to read even more so uh, than the indigenous. So we did a similar kind of thing. Um, and this time, you know, we, we actually did it through interview analysis, but we were looking at kinds of common positive and negative kinds of uh, gaming experiences. And we were very, we were very uh, interested to get a kind of balance. We wanted both the negative outcomes, and you can't see very well, but only eight of these items are what I would call um, addiction type symptoms. So things like uh, withdrawal, they're, they're marked if you can see the little footnote here. Uh, negative cognitive salience, uh, withdrawal, tolerance, um, 
uh, and, and so forth. But there are other kinds of problem gaming experiences, like a feeling of social isolation being connected to me playing too much, right? Or a need for social approval, or the community being somehow toxic, or me getting really frustrated and angry, which isn't exactly addiction, it's something else, right? Um, and so we ran some analyses, and I'm going to go through a couple slides really quickly on that instrument. Uh, and here's one, and we found out something very interesting. It turns out that loneliness, this is the internet gaming disorder, a common kind of gaming disorder, nine items scale. It turns out loneliness is a very good predictor of problem gaming. Uh, and also, you know, inversely related to positive gaming experiences and strongly positively related to negative gaming experiences. But we did identify through this SCM path analysis certain kinds of things that corresponded with our ethnography. If you're lonely and you get very involved with gaming, you can see the little positive. You build social support because, because you prove yourself in a safe environment. Hey, these, are, these people respect me. I'm a good gamer. I make friends. You actually see less kinds of problem gaming. Or you're lonely, you get really involved in gaming, you build up social support, you reassess the way you think about the value of your gaming in a more positive way, and again, you experience less problem gaming. The point is in a kind of path analysis like this, again, by using this kind of measure, and you could do this also with a positive and negative ethics scale. We used IGD in this context um, because of the audience that we were speaking to. Uh, you see things that gaming and what looks a lot like addiction, high involvement, another scale we built. Yeah, high involvement is correlated <laughs> with addiction, addictive gaming. But through certain paths, high involvement can serve quite different functions, positive. And so this, this plays into a kind of ideas I, about, I have about engagement versus addiction. We collected blood from gamers who scored on a continuum of this positive and negative scale. Uh, and in this case, and I don't have time to say a lot about this, but our scale, if you have a higher balance of positive compared to negative kinds of gaming experiences, you have more of this epigenetic distress. Uh, you're, you're more likely to have this epigenetic distress profile, which we heard described as CTRA the conserved transcriptome response to adversity. So the problem gamers, by our scale, it turns out the, 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 the GD, the gaming disorder, the IGD, didn't work very well. And I have things to say about that. It's not an insider's cultural model, culturally sensitive scale. Our scale worked, <laughs> right? Now I have things to say about that. But if you have a higher balance of positive compared to negative, you have less of this gene expression distress scale. If you have a higher balance of negative compared to positive gaming experiences, you have more of the CTRA gene expression distress, distress scale. What is this distress scale? We heard some people talk about it, but it's basically 52 genes that are immune function genes, things like inflammation, interferon, antibody production of various kinds. And it's a kind of proxy that Steve Cole, Carol Worthman, and others have developed as a kind of proxy of a, an experience of, of the feeling of stress, anxiety, threat, uncertainty. When you're experiencing certain kinds of physical and social threats, your immune function is very responsive. And it up or down regulates. Now, why is this important? This may be, you may think, oh, well, it's obvious. But there's, there's a lot of debates. like. There's no such thing as gaming distress. That's a kind of a, a parody of it. But the idea is like, do certain kinds of problem gaming experiences assessed by our scale, again, as we looked at telomeres, do they manifest themselves in, in the soma, in the body, and in the immune system? And they do. So these gamers, to simplify, who are more problem gamers, are, are, have a greater feeling, as revealed by the body, of a threat of, of, of a feeling of threat and uncertainty, right? Now it turns out that loneliness and social isolation is a big piece of this story, not the whole story, but a lot of that ex some of that explanation goes away when you include uh, loneliness uh, and social isolation. We couldn't include a lot of controls because of the sample size. Last thing I'll say, and I, I will have to end. Um, we did another factor analysis, and, and this is quite surprising, and this is some work in review. 
Um, so we actually had survey data from North America, uh, China, and uh, North America, and, and in Europe as well. And so we did um, some kind of comparisons of the structure of these 21 gaming experience items. Remember, the thing that's interesting here, and something that Lawrence could tell you a lot more about, is, is the symptoms pool. What's the symptoms pool? And if you go into these situations and you just have the common gaming disorder symptoms, so I've got my eight symptoms. I know what addiction is. It's addiction. Addiction's addiction. You can't see this kind of stuff. If you do the ethnography, the interview analysis, the free list, et cetera, you expand the symptom pool. Symptoms pool is also boredom <laughs> and toxicity and frustration and anger, right? It's not just tolerance and withdrawal and cognitive preoccupation in a negative sense, et cetera. And then you do the factor analysis. You can say, are the addiction symptoms holding together in a kind of predictable way across culture? Now, the cultural relativist in, my, in me is like, oh, well, probably not. I mean, come on, there's so many ways that this distress could be configured. Uh, the analysis showed, somewhat to my surprise, is across each of these contexts, uh, there was something that looked a lot like addiction. We had eight addiction symptoms. They're just like, there, first factor in North America. There, all eight of them. All eight of them first factor in North America. All eight of them first factor in Europe. Six of the eight in China. What? Good enough, right, good enough. But then there's some interesting nuances. In North America and China, there's a kind of, I push myself too hard, a kind of achievement motivation. Uh, and I feel lonely. Loneliness contributes to my overplay. They're also there. So I think the story was um, that you know, addiction, something like gaming disorder, as proposed by the WHO, it was just approved you know, in June of this year as official to be included in the ICD-11, is not bad. There's something like that as a cognitive, experiential, behavioral object in the world. But culture is important, right? Um, and I think I have to end. Uh, there. Thank you. Any urgent questions? Urgent. Thanks, Jed. Um, this may be a little tangential, but now that we have you on stage, I'd love for you to speak a little about uh, another notion you've developed in your video game where you study idioms and wellness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's a we use the free listing That's a great tool question. To study that in a different cultural context. So, so this was systematic interview. This is so. Yeah. There's a so uh, Joe Weaver and uh, and Bonnie Kaiser in association with uh, Dr. Kermeyer's uh, journal, Transcultural Psychiatry. They have a an issue on idioms of, of distress coming out and cultural syndromes and kind of new approaches. So my team, we have an article coming out in that. And I didn't get to show you some of that analysis. Um, but I'll just respond to, to Samuel's. Uh, and so this analysis will be there if you're interested. I think it's very important to talk about the positive and not just the negative side. So you can see this is we were being kind of clever. But every negative, being thinking about World of Warcraft all the time, yeah, that might interfere with your relationship. But maybe it feels it's, it's like positive anticipation. So every negative experience, you can think of a kind of parallel, positive, cognate experience. So we are very careful to assess. Again, sometimes it's interviews and structured interview analysis. I use a program called MaxQDA that helps us with our coding and managing our coding and counting you know, times that certain themes arrive, arise and so forth. But this is very important because for me, both in the Saharia case and in this case, if, and I, I think, I, I'll repeat the comment, but I said it, I think it was yesterday. If someone has scores huge on this, all these negative kinds of symptoms, you know, very high, and almost no positive benefit, that's a problem to me. But what if they're equal? <laughs> or what if they're both high and, one, and positive is a little higher? It's different, right? So I think looking at, I would encourage you all to think about developing scales that also you know, uh, account for positive kinds of experience. Because as you learn, there, there are a lot of reasons to do this. A lot of them are just to understand the phenomenon better. Because I think that addiction is probably better understood as high involvement, higher negative th to, to positive kinds of experience, not just gaming, not just negative experiences, right? It has, it's, it's a number of things, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, and there was, yes. It's very briefly to what you just said at the end, and not knowing your work that well, but a lot of what is understood as what happens in addiction is a certain avoidance 
So you're going to have yes. certain positive effects by indulging in any avoidance that, that will come out. So if, you're, uh, if you have social phobia and you suddenly have a social environment where you're able to interact with people, that will inevitably be positive in, in that yeah. scale of avoiding something, yes. which doesn't necessarily mean That's that... That's true. So I, I'm just throwing out... No, it's a good thought. point. I, you know, I do, I think of... I think uh, the way I, I've come to understand this is there's, there's temporary escape and even dissociative escape. And I've written about this, 2011, Culture Medicine Psych. I actually use that term dissociation. Temporary dissociative escape from your bosses and problems and relationships is good. It's healthy. Uh, that's different than long-term avoidance. And there, I, there are ways, n n a little less so in this Instance, though, I think our conflict item picks up some of that. If you're avoiding things and the problems aren't going away, you got to, I have to look at how it's phrased. You're going to be magnifying certain kinds of problems. That's, so the caveat that we have in is gaming disorder good or bad? It's like, well, this is one view of it. It's not with clinical patients. It's not longitudinal. It's not clinical interview, right? So there are a lot of other methods. And that's, it's good that you mentioned that because that's a bigger point that I would say the same thing I made, the same point I made with cultural schema and model, it's, it's one proxy for something. Come at these phenomena with a lot of different proxies and measures and try to understand the phenomena from different points of view using different methods. It's a great question. Yes? I want to go back to the study. Yeah. I want to perhaps, if I may, push you further. Yeah, sure. In terms of understanding the context. I wonder how effective and accurate this kind of distinct uh, uh, items were uh, would be, uh, considering the fact that in most cultural contexts, the emotional are not just um, semantic symbols, but they are more like pragmatic context. So I wasn't chiming in that, yes, you're making great points. Um, so I, I don't think I can respond to everything you said, but, but I would say, first of all, when you work with a team. And so you saw part of my team, Dr. Chakrapani, for example, I mentioned. So we'd have discussions every night. Um, and so that's one thing, is you do see the phenomena. I, I moved from being a lone ethnographer. This is a larger study, a story about how I moved from being a certain kind of cultural anthropologist, lone ethnographer to working in teams, using mixed methods, et cetera. Uh, I totally agree with you. I saw so many things through, through their eyes. And again, they're middle class, Hindu caste, you know, Indians, educated. So they're only seeing certain things. Uh, we had local research assistants. Gunshyam Sharma, I could have mentioned him. 
so many insights, right? Um, that we wanted to bring women uh, with us uh, into the field, uh, but it turns out bringing a middle-class Udaipuri young woman <laughs> with strange men in a Jeep into the middle Central India is not tolerated <laughs> very easily. So that was a kind of bias that we couldn't do that, though my preference would be to have uh, women on the research team uh, as well, right? Um, that's part of the other thing I would say, I totally agree with the complex. I think this is one vision of, um, of how to get at these emotional uh, experiences. And you could, you could I, I, we use like the notion of emotion or a certain kind of experience. You could use symptoms. If, you're, if you have a kind of syndrome, like a locally no, named syndrome, you could take a slightly different um, approach. Um, but if you see things <laughs> in the field, things happen. Someone told you something. It's fair game to put to build other kinds of things into the scales that seem meaningful, because of even if they weren't particularly salient in the free listing, for example, context. So I think the context of ethnography, and observation, and a richer interview, and then something happens and you ask people about it, you st start to get at other kinds of things, right? Now, some of that stuff you're talking about on the level of the factor analysis, when you start seeing clusters of experiences and you start trying to give them names, and sometimes they are named or sometimes they're not named, right? So when the, the symptoms or the experiences start to cluster together, you start to see other kinds of things. Does that answer some of or address some of the kinds of things you're talking about? Okay. And obviously it's important to get that kind of a as well, but uh, also I'm saying that with emotion, if you if you thought there yeah if, if you thought there was an emotion term I'm I'm not doctrinaire like in a grounded theory approach I didn't talk about interview coding et cetera but in a grounded theory approach they're really doctrinaire or in a you know in a certain f forms of cognitive anthropology it can't be theory driven it can't be top down so you can't bring in anything that didn't appear in the context of say the free listing problem I'm not like that. If there are things that you think should be meaningful in a theory-driven kind of way or your own experience or whatever, you can test them in some sense and see how they resonate with local kinds of peoples and then incorporate them into your measures, I would say. Okay.